Hey, Steve Sretsky here. As always, Canadian Real Estate Market Update with your particular focus on Vancouver. If you get any sort of value entertainment out of these videos, all I ask that you hit thumbs up and subscribe. Questions, comments, put those below. Um, so to dive into this week's video, obviously a lot happening uh, still. Um, as a macro investor, uh, as a spectator as well, uh, I find that uh, as difficult as these times may be, um, I find that this is the macro investor's Super Bowl. Uh, so highly entertaining, at least from that aspect, but certainly uh, very difficult uh, for a lot of people. And uh, you know, again, even for myself from times, um, certainly can be mentally draining, um, you know, seeing all this play out. I mean, we have, um, I think the latest Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg uh, estimate from when they go around, they pull all the big economists. I think that they're saying, you know, second quarter GDP could contract. Their median estimate now is 42%. I mean, that is just absolutely devastating. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think that can be certainly mentally draining, but uh, I do want to get onto a couple things this week. Uh, we had CMHC's Evan Sadal um, out this past week, some very, very interesting comments. Uh, I've talked a lot about talked a lot about Evan Sadal on the show. Uh, I have to give the guy kudos, but uh, without further ado, let's just clip into his uh, words right now. Deferrals are adding to already historic levels of household indebtedness, and I provided you with some slides on that. Canadians are among world leaders in household debt, as as the committee knows. Pre-COVID, the ratio of gross debt to GDP for Canada was about 99% due in part to increased borrowing, but even more so to projected declines in GDP, we estimate it will increase to above 115% in the second quarter of this year and reach 130% in the third quarter before declining. These ratios, I note, are well in excess of the 80% threshold above which the Bank for International Settlements has demonstrated that national de debt intensifies the drag on GDP growth. Looking at debt multiples of disposable income, a number uh, people are more familiar with, that measure will climb from 176% in late 2019 to well over 200% through 2021. Moreover, CMHC is now forecasting a decline in average house prices in Canada of 9 to 18% in the coming 12 months. We're therefore evaluating whether we should change our underwriting policies in light of developing market conditions. I should say that our support for home ownership cannot be unlimited. It's like blood pressure. You can have too much, you need some. Housing demand is far easier to stimulate, we found, than supply, and the result, as we've seen, is Economics 101, ever increasing prices. So if housing affordability is our aim, as surely it must be, then there has to be a limit to the demand we help to create, especially when supply isn't keeping up. People believe that owning a home is essential for retirement savings, and indeed over the last 20 years, and there's a study I've given you a chart on, that shows most of the increase in the share of wealth over the last 20 years in, in Western countries has been in housing. The average Canadian homeowner in the last 20 years has had a tax-free gain, on average, of $340,000 in the value of their home. That sounds great until you add in the fact that $300,000 of that gain has been created by increased borrowing. These house prices and debt levels are increasingly out of reach for young people. And in fact, home ownership tends to be lower in countries with, low, with higher incomes. In addition to restraining our underwriting practices to limit excessive borrowing, we at CMHC must also take decisive urgent action to accelerate the supply of rental housing. So I had to laugh when this video comes out. Um, and I'm actually going to link, there's a link in the description below to his full comments, his full 45 minute interview. Um, highly worth checking that out if you're uh, if you want to geek out. Uh, but I had to laugh when this interview came out because if there's, if there's one way, if there's one way that I can think of that would possibly help push house prices down upwards of 18% across the board, is to have a government agency the government agency, the one that controls basically the entire Canadian mortgage market, that does the bulk of insuring of Canadian mortgages, to have him come out publicly and say that we're forecasting an 18% in the next 12 months? Um, talk about a way to crush consumer confidence and really impact market sentiment. 
Um, so, I mean, again, I have to give the guy kudos, at least for having the kahunas to come out and make uh, what I would say for a government agency is a very, very bold prediction. I mean, that that is a pretty negative scenario. Uh, again, could drop more, could drop less. I think everyone at this point during a global pandemic is guessing. But the fact that CMHC, again, came out and said that uh, is definitely a, <laughs> it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, but I will say uh, as a realtor, and I know realtors in this profession, that uh, most of them uh, are very um, conservative and would prefer not to talk about negative, uh, you know, negativity in the market and the possibility for price declines. Um, that this almost gives like a realtor like ammo to be like, hey client, like, you know, um, you know, we know you're, that you're listed, you're not really selling, and you've been on for a couple months. Uh, hey, uh, by the way, you should read this report from uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation that said prices could drop 18% in the next 12 months. Maybe we should lower your price. Um, so it certainly makes that conversation easier. I think he's taken a lot of the uh, tough legwork for uh, off the realtor's plate anyways. Um, so again, my natural bias or my my natural tendency. Again, I've said this is I would probably agree with Sadal. I'm not really sure about the magnitude of the pace of it all. I think trying to predict house prices is a bit of a mugs game. Um, but I think certainly the probabilities to the downside are obviously pretty obvious. I mean, again, 20% unemployment rate, yada yada yada. Uh, but I do, for the sake of things, because I believe that. Um, I believe that two sides of the argument make a market and I believe that generally speaking the truth is somewhere in the middle so you see these really negative estimates and CMHC is probably not the worst estimate but you see these negative estimates and you see the, the positive estimates and I usually find that the truth is somewhere in the middle and that's why I highly enjoy spending a lot of my time on Twitter following a lot of the greatest financial minds on Twitter and hearing their dialogue, right? Whether that's talking about the stock market, is it gonna hit all time? Is it gonna hit new highs? Is it gonna retest the lows and drive through that? Inflation, deflation. It's like everybody right now has an opinion and it's it's blatantly obvious that nobody truly knows the full answer. But I do wanna play devil's advocate on the decline in house prices. Again, that's my view, but the the, the devil's advocate on, on my other shoulder says, hmm, Okay, uh, if you look at mortgage purchase applications, for example, in the United States, they've done a basically a V-shaped recovery. Again, I'm not sure if that's gonna hold, if that's gonna be sustainable, if the worst is yet to come, uh, but I do find that very, very interesting because you, you kind of, you weigh that with uh, mortgage forbearances, I think in the US just topped five million. Um, so, which is almost reaching the 2008, 2009 levels. Uh, well, it's a couple million off, but, um, so I'm kind of weighing weighing those two, and uh, you know we talk about uh, you know central bank interference. Uh, the Bank of Canada's balance sheet is now tripled. It's tripled in basically two months. Um, so the the amount of liquidity that is being pumped into the market is certainly going to be beneficial for asset prices over the long run. And now again, I want everybody to take this just gently into consideration put your biases aside, whether you're bullish or bearish, I think you all know relatively where I, I stand for the most part. Um, but let's just say hypothetically that, let's say you are a very wealthy individual. Let's say, let's say you have, you know, let's pick a number, 5 million, 10 million, 15, 20 million dollars worth of asset, worth of net worth to deploy. Um, in this current environment, I ask of you, uh, where would you personally put your money? It is like this is a genuine question. I, I I genuinely want to know, and if you can comment in the comment section below, that would be very very helpful um, because I kind of want to understand the sentiment. But where would you put your money? So there's a couple things that I look at it from. Let's just say you have a ten million dollar net worth, sizable. Um, that cash, do you, do you leave it in the bank? you're not really earning any rate of return in the bank. Um, we're probably decent probability that you get negative interest rates. Um, do you put it in the bond market? Um, the the two-year yield, the two-year yield on a U.S. government bond is now 10 basis points. Um, 
that is horrendous. So there's basically no bond market. I think the 10 year yield is like 65 basis points as of this recording. Um, so there's no really a bond market. You can't really keep it in cash. Uh, I mean, gold's obvious. Bitcoin is, I think is a decent, I mean, potential play. Obviously there's a lot of risk there as well. Um, now, you, again, you basically destroyed the bond market, which is like the largest sort of financial asset class um, because there's no yield in there. And where, where are they going to go? I mean, yields could go from, from say, you know, that 10-year note could go from 65 basis points down to zero. Um, I mean, heck, maybe it even goes negative. I don't know. Uh, but there's not, a whole lot of, there's not a whole lot of movement there. So, again, and I, I'm just looking at this because, like, as we can see, I, I think about this constantly from a macro perspective is let's turn our attention to Hong Kong for for, for now um, some wealthy individuals in Hong Kong uh, you have you have the Chinese the CCP coming in and saying that they're going to implement laws now that are basically they're gonna basic they're basically going to they're basically going to control the dictatorship over there they're saying enough's enough protesting we're basically going to come in we're going to enforce our way our law onto the Hong Kong people and so obviously there's there's all these concerns now about well this is probably the end of basically free freedom and, and, and rights so to speak in Hong Kong uh, free speech etc um, and so it makes me wonder as a Hong Kong individual where would I, I, I the first thing that I would be doing is I would be getting my money out of Hong Kong First, first thing. Now, again, where where do you put it as a, as a wealthy individual in Hong Kong? I'm not saying that they're going to come here and plop it all into Vancouver real estate. I certainly wouldn't put all of it into Vancouver real estate. But would I buy a safe haven asset? Uh, and where? Well, yes, I would. But where is that safe haven asset? Is it U.S. stocks? Is it U.S. real estate? Is it Vancouver real estate? Is it? So I think that's how you have to think from a, from a larger global picture. Is that basically today you wonder why stock prices and say housing are kind of detached from the real world? It's because again you've basically eliminated the bond market. Um, there's so much geopolitical risk. There's so much uncertainty in the world that uh, these assets are basically uh, and so much money printing QE that basically the the, the all this this money creation uh, is funneling into the, the safe havens and I think that kind of comes back to the US dollar bullish thesis and the bullish case maybe for stocks again I, I, I my view is that you're gonna have personal views that you probably have another retest uh, of you for US stocks I don't know if you're gonna retest those lows per se uh, I think there's some more downside but I just think like if we look at this chart here for example this is the um, the ratio historical ratio between S&P 500 dividends versus uh, uh, yield, treasury yields and as you can see it's just completely blown up because there, there's basically there's zero yield uh, uh, for for treasury notes or for, for government bonds essentially so central banks have eliminated that pricing mechanism um, so those are things that I kind of think about in context and um, yeah, I think it's worth evaluating uh, what what you would do and, and trying to take that larger picture as opposed to I know that, and I've been guilty of this before, is trying to take asset prices and saying, well, they're going to relocate to some semblance of of incomes and what what should be right. But we have to look at this and say, well, again, unfortunately, we've destroyed um, the bond market. So um, it's kind of how I'm looking at it. Again, I think that the bond market is obviously telling us. The bond market certainly believes that deflation um, is coming. The CPI in Canada, as I mentioned it would, turned negative in April. Negative. Negative CPI. Again, I don't know if that's going to last, but you had a negative CPI. So you have, you have a lot of debt, some deflation. Debt and deflation equals a solvency crisis. And I think that is where we're going to be going into over the next 12 months is a solvency crisis. Um, again, uh, so the, the central banks have solved uh, some of the liquidity issues. As he even talked, even if you listen to Evan Siddall's CMHC discussions, he even talks about that the, the program that they brought in, the IMP, IMPP, Insured Mortgage Purchase Program, has not really been used. I think they've 
they've used nine billion dollars of 150 billion dollar allocation because they're getting the banks are getting supplementary funding from the Bank of Canada at a cheaper rate and from the open market because there's still liquidity. They were able to solve the liquidity trap um, by printing an insane amount of money and interjecting that aspect. Um, so I, I, again, take these things into consideration as you form your views and your thesis. And that's all the show is all about. It's just about having a conversation, a dialogue, and a view um, to have that discussion about financial markets. Not necessarily about predicting you know, what's going to happen and what to do and when to buy and when to sell. It's, it's just having that conversation and then allowing, you know, obviously everybody makes their own decisions in life. So we're all here to learn. Uh, if that video brought you any sort of value entertainment this week, hit thumbs up. Give me, a, give me the old subscribe button and uh, we'll see you next week.